Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Where Boundaries Dissolves podcast. I am your host, Helena, and this is my podcast full of inspiring stories with leaders that have transformed themselves, are in alignment with who they are and what makes them unique, because I believe that when we're purpose-driven and our purpose is aligned with what we do, and we're constantly seeking to evolve, that's when we are able to be on a path of taking our business and our roles in society to the next level. Today, we are joined by Tom, the co-founder of Vizzy, a company who's been Netherlands' best employer four times in a row now, quite an accomplishment, and one of the best places to work in Europe, applying the ancient wisdom of self-organization. Vizzy is an expert in housing and mortgage advice who wants to contribute towards a sustainable financial world by investing in lasting relationships and products that create freedom of choice, consciousness, and transparency. Tom, again, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for being guest in your podcast, Elena. What do I need to know about you to understand the man, the leader, the co-founder of Vizzy that sits in front of me today? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a good question to start with. Yeah, let's be very open and honest. What I just found out is if a lot of people are entrepreneurs or managers, uh, leaders, if they, if they talk about purpose in the end, there often is a kind of connection with the personal life of people which is in a way understandable eh? because we all go through development, crisis, whatsoever, depending on your background, it influences what you do in your daily life. For a long time, I didn't talk about that so much about my personal life. It always talked about, let's say, the company and about uh, HR topics and putting people first, etc. But then at a certain point, when I was asked about purpose, then in the end, I said, it's very easy. When I was 20, I got severely ill. I had cancer. Wow. And, tw and 20 is, is pretty early. Mm -hmm. And I had a chance of surviving it uh, of 20%. Wow. And then the good thing about surviving something severe is that afterwards, life is in a way easier. And I think that's a kind of common determinator for a lot of people who are purpose-driven. can be that they had to flee a country because there was a war or uh, lost their parents or had other severe issues. And then it makes life very relative. So this whole idea is that, let's say, a professional life is about to be as successful as possible to show other people how much money you have earned by showing off big cars or even airplanes or whatsoever. I think those things become very relative. If you would ask people at the end of their lives what has been important, you never hear money as a determinator. You always hear health, my health, my kids, my family, my relationships, etc. So and everybody knows this. So so I think the conclusion is that, uh, yeah, what should people know? It's not about me. It's more about each other. If we if we live with each other, that life is very short and it is about relationships. And in the end, probably about, let's say, doing something positive. Mm -hmm. So walk me through that time in your life. What you, I'm assuming you're in the middle of your studies. When you were 20, or had you, were you done? Yeah, I was in the beginning of my studies. I studied in the Netherlands, history and international law. And then suddenly, and everything, I mean, if you're 20, then you're at a really interesting point of your life. Not any formal obligations. Uh, financed by my parents. Uh, nice university life. Yeah, and then suddenly, uh, you're hit by such an illness. And they say, oh, it's, I never expected it at that age. That doesn't mean that, let's say, after this illness, I decided let's do something very purposeful in a sense that 
we discuss it nowadays in a way, let's build a company which changes the world or something like that. But it's a little bit easier to do the stuff you would like to do and not care so much about what you should do at that moment because your parents expect that or your environment expects that. So for instance, I traveled a lot during my studies afterwards and I didn't, I didn't work. And everybody said, oh, it's important you gain experience and this kind of stuff. I just took my backpack and, and hitchhiked through Europe. Mm-hmm. And I was not building my CV by spending my summer vacation in those important companies which, which make an impression on your CV. It's just a very practical example. Mm-hmm. That's very interesting. And I have a lot of conversations with different people and they, you know, There's this notion of everything in life happens for you, not to you. But the conversation gets really interesting when you have that conversation with people who've lost a parent very early or lost a child, or in your case, have struggled with, uh, have to survive illness. Mm -hmm. What would, how would you, have you been able to, do you think, you know, things just happen or do you see it as something that happened for you? I don't think there is, let's say it's it's even a kind of, I don't know if it's religious, but I actually don't know because let's say if people are born in Syria, I mean, then they are all really suffering. And then the question is, does this help them? No, it doesn't help them at all. It's not brought to them because they are all become purpose-driven entrepreneurs or something like that. Now they're just bummed out of their houses. I, I, w- I wouldn't see a correlation. The only thing is that let's say normally people would reflect on life at this midlife crisis where you say, is my career so important? Am I in the right right relationship? Do I want to have kids or do I have kids? Or uh, what is important? And in, in my life, it was there when I was, I was 20. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you never recommend somebody to lose parents or become ill or, or getting bumped out of your house. So I think when the situation is just there, then in retros, I would say it was the most important experience I got and I'm very happy. But that's always easily said Mm -hmm. after you have survived this kind of stuff. And that's something you never know the moment you're really in. I mean, you can hope for it, but... It also could have been a very short life. You mentioned something before is like it, it freed you almost of the the need to go after these material possessions and status and power as a need to feel accepted by society. And I feel like this is a huge reason why we climb the corporate career ladders is to to because we're in comparison with our peers because we want to prove ourselves. And it ultimately comes down to this fear of being rejected fear of of dying you know and when you face death literally it's it's it frees you of that so you went traveling instead of doing a bunch of internships or looking for jobs and all this kind of stuff in what other ways have you experienced yourself being much more free to make decisions more in line with your values instead of coming from making decisions from a place of fear yeah, I have some examples, but it's it's not only always positive. So, mm, so let's say when, just shortly after my illness, mm. I let's say you have a focus on what is important and what is not. And I mean, I, I, I never was a great small talker, but let's say I just I just said, for instance, to my to my girlfriend at that time, I, I'm not going to this dinner because. These are uninspiring conversations. <laughs> uh, and that's also something which in a social environment, there is a certain amount of small talk. Mm-hmm. And for your environment, if you just only want to go for the hard stuff mm-hmm. and for the substantial stuff, that's not so easy. And then after a certain time, you become more, let's say, sociable again. But I mean, I can do small talk, but at a certain point, I still hate it because mm, and, and, and I I'm, hear really, you. I'm, I'm really happy. I, I don't have to attend all those parties and just telling the same stories over and over again without any real substantial subject. I still prefer a mm. small amount of people and a real conversation 
over uh, a lot of people and and no real substantial conversation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and 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 that's something which that's not only that's not only positive and the other thing is that what i also notice if i if i exchange views with other people with same backgrounds you want to do too much stuff because you always have this idea i don't know if i have enough time mm-hmm. that's a kind of obsession mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for a long time i just work too much because okay mm-hmm. i can still do this and still do that and etc that means that the risk of burning yourself is just much higher it's also not so easy for the people around you. Mm-hmm. And the other thing is that in a business context, you can really drive a lot of people around you very crazy because you mm-hmm. you send emails at at times where other people are already asleep, etc. Just for, out of a kind of enthusiasm. It's not because you want to burn other people, but but to work together with mm-hmm. me is. It's not always that easy. So I always explain those people, also new colleagues, I exp- when I have a very intense working relationship, I explain those people, say, okay, if you just get emails from me, just put off your computer. So I, I have become more civilized now, but but I have been times where people said, I don't understand, I get an email at two o'clock at night and then seven o'clock in the morning. What, what, what are you doing? So it, it's not only positive. Mm-hmm. I see that. That can be quite intense. I can I can relate with that. <laughs> There's a very nice quote from a German uh, filmmaker, Fassbinder. He said, I can sleep when I'm dead. Mm-hmm. So, so he made an enormous amount of movies, but he died with 41. But his idea, I, I want to make this next movie. You see a lot of, of those artists as well. The heroes die young. They have such an enormous creative energy and they have a kind of painting in their mind and they have to paint this next painting during the night and they go on and on if you if you read stuff about picasso or others that those are maniacs mm-hmm. i mean it's just not cre- creativity they creativity they want to they want to put on a, in a, into a painting or a piece of art or whatsoever but it's also very difficult for those people around to live with those with those uh, artists or, but also in a, in a modern context, those people like Elon Musk, I mean, he is not a big example for me personally, but, yeah, but those yeah. people are, are also just, if you read about his family life or, or see interviews and then something doesn't work in the Tesla factory and he just sleeps in the factory just to solve the problem because he is just so obsessed with the stuff he does. I mean, I'm, I'm not that crazy, but, but I just want to say obsession also has a very negative side. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's very interesting that's very interesting yeah for me it's definitely very important I'm very harmony driven I interact with people at work so that would be definitely important to me if I realized that I was causing a lot of pressure for the people around me <laughs> we actually had a CFO who was doing the same thing and then he found a I'm not saying this is the right thing but he found a setting so that all of his emails would be marked going out at 7 a.m. in the morning so that people weren't getting that anxiety from seeing, oh my God. That's correct. You know? yeah. yeah. I'm privileged that I'm in a, in a small company and we were between 30 and 40 people. And the people I work with, the, my main, let's say, colleague, I work together for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that. So she knows me. What I just found interesting about Harmony is that in a business context, uh, harmony is, is not my topic. Mm-hmm. So I don't have any, let, I would call it difficulties to escalate or to get cr- confrontation. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, in my private life, I'm extremely defensive and very reluctant. Let's say in a private situation, I'm much more anxious to have a kind of confrontation. Mm-hmm. It's the opposite for me. And, and and people and people who who know me from a business context can't or or, or see me in those both contexts uh, often don't understand that that it's the same person. I wonder how much of that is the cultural upbringing, being Dutch, because I I, I used to work with a, a Dutch colleague and I felt he was very outspoken. And it was a it was yeah. considered a, a way of also just getting work done, and so it's like showing that you're actually working towards a goal, and 
being proactive almost towards attaining that goal. Yeah, the Dutch are, there's a lot of research done on that. The Dutch are the most outspoken people, like the Israelis, for instance. Mm -hmm. Their framing is that they see it as a kind of honesty. But Hmm. for others, it's rude and Mm -hmm. and unpolite. So depending on the cultural perspective you're raised in, something is totally different. So I think the Dutch are, especially because I live for such a long time abroad, I live in Switzerland, the Swiss are much more reluctant and you really have to read between the lines. And the Dutch, the Dutch are just, I consider, although I'm Dutch, rude. So especially in international global context where you have mixed teams, that's probably one of the difficult topics. There's, a, by the way, a Dutch scientist, Geert Hofstede, who wrote an excellent book on that, Cultural Dimensions, I think it's called. And, and, and they, they have this power distance and the, and the Dutch mm-hmm. don't have any respect any. for hierarchy, <laughs> which is really difficult. So especially for people who are from a culture where hierarchy plays a role, they have enormous difficulties with the Dutch because, because in the Netherlands, it's just normal that somebody, let's say, would ask the CEO if he just walks into the, the kitchen, just call him by his first name and say, Helena, <laughs> just bring me a coffee if you just go to the kitchen. And everybody oh, would really? say, but, but he's a CEO, you know, it doesn't yeah. work like that. But that's that's in a way normal. In, abroad, you would never do this. There mm-hmm. is still, and in Switzerland, you also wouldn't do that. <laughs> no. If you are in a modern context of, of uh, trying and feel fast, mm-hmm. there it's, it's really great because... What happens in the Netherlands is you discuss something and then you think you have a kind of conclusion or at least the foreigners think you have a kind of conclusion and then everybody accepts that conclusion. But the Dutch, they just walk away and think, I still have a better idea. I, I do it I do it in another way. And, and in this kind of agile environment, you would say, okay, you have a kind of A-B testing because people just do what they think themselves is best. But if you have to scale up a company, for instance, this horror it's a kind of common anarchy so to say how do you deal with that so becoming really clear on what are the next steps and who is an ownership of what it is what is the d- definition of done becomes key it's a good bridge to the topic of self-organization because that's why for instance in the Netherlands you have a lot of companies or let's say in in comparison to other companies if you have a locracy uh, with uh, Brian Robertson who is a US guy he does his annual conference in Amsterdam. Now, why is this the case? Because there are this whole idea of self-organization, which, by the way, is not an invention of the Americans, but a lot of theoretical work has been done in cultures where you have a tradition of self-organization. Mm. And the Netherlands is just one of those countries. Mm-hmm. It really helps because, let's say, if you use the strength of taking decisions for yourself, mm-hmm. then self-organization really works well. And then you have to split and say, okay, most stuff you can decide on your own. So, for instance, if you think that that's the best for your client, you are allowed to take that decision, and then it's something positive. But there are some rules we all have to obey. That can be, for instance, regulatory rules. And you still have to be very clear that there is certain stuff which really is standard, and everybody has to accept this. But on the other hand, it also creates freedom for, especially in this kind of model of self-organization, where people find then yeah, subjective ways of, of dealing with certain topics and also are willing to take, I wouldn't say to take a risk, but to take responsibility mm-hmm. for the best outcome. Mm-hmm. And that's super challenging in these cultures that are naturally more hierarchical and, you know, so do you think this kind of model fits everywhere? <coughs> uh, it's difficult to say, but let's say just to take a very practical example, because otherwise it's, it's perhaps too theoretical. Mm. I traveled in Switzerland between Basel and Zurich, and you have two ways of traveling f- between those two towns. The ticket has the same price, but I took the wrong route. Mm-hmm. And there's somebody in the train who had to uh, had the obligation to ask for my ticket said, you're taking the wrong route and you have to buy a new ticket. And then I said, yeah, okay, it took the wrong, but it's exactly the same price. In the Netherlands, somebody would have just said, okay, it's the same price. Uh, but it was a huge discussion. It took, I don't oh know, a quarter, quarter, quarter of an hour. And you also see a lot of people then watching you. What is this guy doing, etc.? 
that's a very practical example. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I, I wouldn't say it's black and white. Let's say very strict rules about processes. If you talk about security, etc., then it's very good when things are very, very strict. Mm-hmm. I think it's it should be a kind of mix. And perhaps, especially in those big corporations, mixing mm-hmm. of these different cultures really helps. Mm-hmm. And And I think one has to explain the theoretical backgrounds, why this is the case. I mean, mm-hmm. we just had a, a short uh, talk on this mm-hmm. before the podcast started. If you produce cars or airplanes or uh, machinery, etc., you can't just experiment and everybody makes makes the tool in a different way. It has to be very strict standardization of how to build a car because otherwise, otherwise you have a big issue. But if you are a merchant and you would just experiment by taking a product into your grocery shop or whatsoever, say, okay, I I don't know if people like food from Thailand, but I will just put it here and try to sell it in in a supermarket, see what happens. I mean, that's something which you really can just test. Mm -hmm. But but depending on the culture and what you do, it's Mm -hmm. easy to test. And on the other hand, if you produce something, or if you build watches, a watch has a function to show you the time. And you can't say, ah, it's plus minus five minutes. It tells you what the time is now. It's very interesting what you say. I've had different people on the podcast. I had Doug Kirkpatrick, who was part of the founding team at uh, Morningstar, a purely yeah, self-organized. Him. Yeah. And he was talking about how, you know, when you establish it from the ground up and you... Um, value based, it it works because they're a, a tomato production company. So you know it applies there. And then I've uh, interviewed and spoken to consultants about running initiatives, self organized initiatives at Siemens. And Siemens is very hierarchical. And her notion was you can you can do it in parts of the organization, but in other parts that are kind of like the controls and gatekeepers, there's it's not necessary. You don't need that. And I thought that was very interesting because in companies like Siemens, there is transformation happening everywhere. And there is a higher level of complexity in a lot of places of the organization. So I personally would advocate for you kind of almost need like hybrid skills in people who are able to, based on the problem that is in front of them, apply a more self-organized approach or you know, a waterfall project management, which is in a sense more hierarchical. Is this something you observe as well in, in your company that there's this this split between um, the two or how is, how, yeah, how is that handled? Perhaps it's our company. I don't know if our company is, is such a good example because let's say if you have a very, if you are very small, then things are just much easier. When you just talked about Siemens, I had to think about Roche and Novartis. Uh, the big pharmaceutical companies in Switzerland, they also could be interesting for you to interview them because on the one hand, they have to be very strict. And my pharmaceuticals, I mean, that's not something where you can just say, oh, we'll do a little bit like this or a little bit like that. But that has to be very, very precise. You're talking about the lives. And, And it would be interesting to know their perspective on that. Roche, as an example, often visited us in in Amsterdam with different teams, hmm. but but I really don't know in practice what their lessons learned are in this pharmaceutical context. Hmm. What you will also see if you talk about the, let's say German uh, economy and Siemens, and for instance, especially if you talk about Germany, a lot of people will think about the big car brands. Then the question is also, where do you experiment? Eh? I mean, you, you can't just build one type of car and still say to another team, uh, you have a kind of budget, try to build a very cheap car or try to build an electric car or try to build a, a big family van where you can still, let's say, experiment next to your very strict hierar- hierarchical process-driven Porsche assembly lines, etc. So I really don't know. But on the other hand, if you talk about car ma- manufacturing, Toyota, you have this red handle everybody can just pull mm-hmm. when they think something goes wrong in the assembly line. That's very interesting. In terms of your personal experience leading self-organized, co-founding self-organized company, 
it's all about transparency and putting people first, as you talk about in a lot of the podcasts that you've been on and building these leadership capacities in, in everyone. In other companies, there is, as you alluded to before as well, this need for status and power. And oftentimes people were promoted for their level of expertise. So there's a lot of control in decision-making. There's, there's an enjoyment of being in control of decision-making and bring, being, to be able to bring in your expertise as well. And so with the level of complexity rising, I do observe a need to shift towards more self-organized approaches and being an empowered team that can make decisions. But this takes a change in how managers see their roles and letting go of this control. How do you feel safe letting go of, of that control? Is that something that you, or is that because you're Dutch, as you were saying, there's this low power distance, that's not really a topic? I would, let's say, if you zoom out, the question is, how do you see yourself? Do you see yourself as a leader or as a kind of, uh, you, can, you can say, a provider or a coach or whatsoever? I mean, you're a Swiss or at least half Swiss. Um, I, I believe much more in this team attitude and, and not about the strong CEO, the strong leader or the empathic leader or the serving leader etc i i believe more in in rotation it's it's always very easy to say okay somebody is more experienced just just go on but if you just take the swiss political system <clears throat> which i found a, was an excellent example uh, nobody knows that the swiss government doesn't have a, a precedent for this whole period no it has a rotation of this of this bundesrat of this government people and they rotate every year and, and I, I don't know any example of a, of a recent uh, or actual government where it works that way. And then you could say, no, somebody would be more capable, etc. But it stabilizes this whole political culture in an excellent way. And that in combination with the direct democracy, where, where people, I don't know how many, how many weeks are between those, let's say, votes, they still activate all those people to think. And, and, and decide on certain topics. I think that's a very good example. So for instance, at the moment, we have a discussion about our salary model. Uh, shall we raise the salaries? Shall we work less, etc.? And then normally one would say, no, you have the HR department or you have the CEO or you have the board and they decide on that. And we just say, oh, let's just discuss with the people. Mm -hmm. what, mm -hmm. what do people want? Mm -hmm. Because, and then you have this basic, Dem democratic idea i mean if people have voted for something themselves you don't you don't complain afterwards that those bloody politicians did something you didn't want yourself mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. because you voted for for the parking space under the opera in zurich for 50 million or 70 million or you voted in favor of something or against something mm -hmm. and then you can still blame the other ones that they are didn't understand it but but that's then the majority. And then you can still discuss if the majority is is a useful starting point for governing a country. But And I think in companies, that also helps. And if you have a kind of rotation principle, it's also much more difficult to say, we have such an, such an incompetent manager. Because <laughs> at a certain point, you are also the one who has to take this responsibility. And if you then talk about scrum teams or sprints, etc., then you also have this kind of same mechanisms. So why shouldn't you adopt this Asia way of working and shared responsibility and rotation? Why shouldn't you use this for your whole for your whole structure? So for instance, I am not the CEO at the moment. I have been this again the CEO from October to April and now somebody else has done it. I hope next half year somebody they will will rotate further. And it's it's a little bit like um, if you if you would let's say watching bike races like Tour de France etc. And you have a kind of team. For a certain point, you are the one who is who is who is biking in front, and then the next the next takes over, and then and then it rotates all the time. And for instance, if you would if you would try to to drive as fast as possible with let's say four or six people, you have to rotate because otherwise you would never win. It's not it's not always Let's say a team which wins doesn't have somebody who is always driving in front. That just doesn't work. 
That's interesting. So what Doug was talking about is the decision-making power is, lays with the person closest to the action of who's affected and who, who's dealing That's with right. it. So I'm trying to rack my brain around how these different teams form. And then if there's rotating executive leadership, like is how is salary then based? Is it based on the current level of responsibility or how, how is that managed? That doesn't, salary doesn't have anything to do with, let's say, with the role of, of let's say, being responsible at, at a certain time for this coordination of the team. So that's just something which has to be done. So let's say, just take a very practical example in our case to make it more practical. So we have a credit department and there are three, at the moment, I think three, yeah, three colleagues and, uh, and they would just rotate. So every half a year, somebody else takes over and they all have more than 10 years working experience. And their salary the model is based on the level of years of experience. So it's a little bit dull model. It's a little bit like working for a government or a university. We would say you are paid for your loyalty. So we say, okay, every year we say, Helena, thank you that in this new year, you still want to bring your whole self or all your energy bring to our company. Mm -hmm. And for this loyalty, you get a salary increase every year from, I don't know, so many Swiss francs or euros or dollars. And because everybody does this or gets this kind of increase, that's fine. But, but there's something philosophical behind it is that in the end, you could also interview him everybody met, matters, Bob Chapman, an American, um, that, that everybody in this team is equally important. Mm -hmm. So, because you never know, let's say the, the, in our world, we, we often have the idea, I am much more valuable than my colleague. But, but the question is, let's say if you ask people, are you more than an average driver? then 80% of the people say, yes, I'm a better driver than the average driver, which is 80% can't be better than the average driver. So so we all have this kind of positive idea, at least the majority. Least men. Me, yeah, men, <laughs> men much more than women. <laughs> so for instance, if you have this kind of fixed salary increases, it fav favors introvert people and it favors women. Because women always think, okay, I don't know if I can do the job and they do it much better. And the man says, yes, sure, no problem. And they, it's yeah. a, you, can, you, you can put a question mark behind it. So, which <laughs> uh, if you just talk about the research. So, so, but that means that in those teams, or if you talk about the culture of the company, the starting point is the team knows more than the individual. Or mm -hmm. to put it in another way, if you think that you're the smartest guy mm -hmm. in the room, mm -hmm. you better work at another company because mm -hmm. we, as an individual, we mm -hmm. are not smarter than our colleagues. Together, mm -hmm. we mm -hmm. may be smart or build a smart company, but we are only a smarter company when we activate all the intelligence in all the teams because the team is always more intelligent than the individual. Mm -hmm. So are you always searching to bring in people from different backgrounds and how do you manage that so that there's this nice diversity on teams? There's always a lot of discussion about diversity. I actually think that the most important thing is that there is psychological safety where, let's say, people feel strong enough just to share what they think. And it doesn't have any consequence, for instance, for their salaries or bonuses, etc. We don't have bonuses. So on the one hand, there's a lot of discussion about the diversity. But if in those companies which claim to be so diverse, there is a strong bonus culture, I really don't know if people will really speak up, no matter on what, no matter on what subject. So that's one thing. The other thing is that in our self-organizational structure, the people of a team decide themselves who they hire. Mm. It's up to them. And then people would say, yeah, but, but will they hire then exactly this type of person there is already in this team? It may be the case. I really don't know. Um, 
I find it always very difficult to say because let's say this idea of of let's say you can you can you for instance favor women as an example and then if you if you see successful women they are more masculine than those than those guys we criticize so what what did we do we have equal pay because there is no difference between men and women they just start and they get salary raises that's it so that from a systematic starting point there can't be any difference in salaries and you get a salary increase so if people let's say uh, do a sabbatical or take time off because they get children they still have have let's say the same salaries as as men perhaps who didn't take time off or took less time off i'm much more in favor of trying to solve these things in a in a very systematic way mm-hmm. and like the swiss political system Mm-hmm. Uh, as a rotation for for instance then instead of saying try to try to choose the best leader who is the best leader who is the best mm-hmm. person that depends also yeah. very much on the circumstances mm-hmm. and it's interesting do you always know in advance in what situation afterwards somebody will be very valuable i find it very very difficult to say mm-hmm. that's very interesting is the company very young? More than 10 years, 12 years. I mean, not the company itself in terms of like the, the workforce. I'm the oldest with 55. So yeah. uh, so most people are much younger, but it mm-hmm. also has to do that we, what we call, we have a homegrown culture. Let's say half of the company are advisors and they advise people if they want to buy a house and they are paid by the client, by the way, a very good model. So there are no kickbacks between the banks and, and us. We are only paid by the client. And the, the half of the company, those advisors, they often have not that much uh, working experience. But that also has to do with the salary model. Because let's say if you if the starting point is the amount of years of experience, uh, then let's say people who have worked somewhere else wouldn't apply so easy to our company because we have a totally different way of working. Perhaps they don't like self-organization. They think that bonuses is a good thing, etc. Those people don't apply. And and then just people stay in the company. But so we have people who are much older, but then if you grow gradually, then the average, let's say tenure, uh, yeah, stays low. But I don't know exactly what it, perhaps it's 30 or something like that. I don't know exactly. I'm just very curious because it seems like a model that Gen Z and millennials would just gravitate towards and feel very comfortable and at home with. Because the need in those generations is uh, much more authority, authoritarian, authority sensitive. That's why I was wondering. Yeah, I think I, 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 I even... Yeah, could be, but I think it's easier for younger people without any working experience to adapt to those models. So just to put it in another way around, if you have worked for 25 years at Siemens and and you're very used to, let's say, hierarchy as an example, then it will be very difficult to move to a totally different system, which which doesn't say that 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 this hierarchy in that model wouldn't work pretty well. Uh, or if you have been in the army for 25 years and it's very clear on your shirt what rank you have and you just shout down the the line because otherwise it wouldn't work uh, in this context. I don't know if it's uh, just take an example, then it would be very difficult to go to a very equal uh, right. culture yeah, where I think thing. Yeah. Uh, it's more dimensional. But mm-hmm. we have, for instance, the people in the credit department. It's a good it's, 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 uh would be a good example. Those people all had more than ten years working experience before they mm-hmm. they started at our company, mm-hmm. and that that was also not a problem. So mm-hmm. I find mm-hmm. it I find it difficult to answer for our company. Interesting. I do want to touch on your background, being a historian. I mean, obviously, I it's listening from the conversations that you've had. It's it's shaped you introducing the self organization with with Invisi. You've also worked in 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 consulting and more 
more strict hierarchical environments, how has having a different background given you a leg up in your career and in business? Yeah, what I find interesting is, let's say, with my non-business background. I mean, I didn't study economics. Yeah, I studied economics, but more, let's say, international relations or international economics, but not this microeconomics. What I find interesting is if you talk about management between brackets or organizational models and about scaling and big corporations, I find it always interesting that there is not much discussion going on about, let's say, the oldest models we have and that mostly are armies, organizational structures like governments, how states are governed, etc. And the amount of people you have to manage, for instance, in, in a country is much higher than the amount of people you have to manage or to organize in a company. So if you just take this example of Switzerland, again, of the basic democracy, that's a very good example of self-organizational stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Switzerland, it's very, very extreme because also the taxes are decentralized. I am always amazed by the fact that if you talk with people who study business, they they lack this this information. So also these rotation principles are very old. Mm -hmm. And the funny the funny thing is that I mean I took Switzerland as an example, but if you talk about, for instance, the investment banks or the big consultancy companies like for instance McKinsey, it's a rotation principle. So the partners, you call them partners, mm -hmm. and the partners choose somebody for a certain period to be the leading partner. Mm -hmm. And it's at Goldman, it's the case, it's sell all those old merchant or investment banks, always partnerships, and they all choose for a certain period somebody from this round of partners. McKinsey still does it, etc. So it's very interesting that those extreme examples of our economy or even capitalist economy, if you talk about Goldman and McKinsey, etc. I mean, these are not the softies around us. They have rotation principle. Interesting. Yeah, that's really cool. And what is also perhaps an example, because I, perhaps I have to correct also this hierarchy idea of the army, self-organization is actually from our army context. It doesn't come from from a business context. So where does it come from? On a battlefield where you have a lot of smoke, it's difficult to give orders in advance. So so people have to be self-organized because in the battlefield the situation changes so fast that those people on the ground have to decide for themselves what what to do or what's the next move. If people are interested, they have to Google that. Napoleon started with it. And then the Germans, they, when they lost in Jena, I think 1841 or something like that, the Germans, they analyzed that, why they lost. And they made a big uh, theory uh, about that. Also, the Americans, if you are on the West Point, etc., you learn this German uh, decentralized decision-making on the battlefield. Auftragstaktik versus Befehlstaktik, it's called. So you, you give somebody a goal, but the way you conquer the next bridge is left to those people on the ground because you can't say in advance you have to go left or right. So, which I find very interesting. So this whole idea, a big organization and self-organization is something which can't fit together. I mean, the army always has been the biggest organizational form and then also behaving in very complex, fast-changing circumstances. So if somebody who works in a corporate environment with a lot of people where not a lot of stuff changes, like a car manufacturer or Siemens, I would say you should perhaps study von Moltke or Wehrmacht or the Prussian army. They were self-organized and they even didn't have this modern tools like email and telephones and satellites, etc. That's what I find as a historian uh, very interesting. But probably Alexander the Great, when he conquered the world without internet and telephone, also had to, to use a kind of self-organizational system because otherwise I wouldn't know how to 
how to handle those armies. It's fascinating. How do you see this model evolve in the future? Do you think it will evolve? Are you, you know, you have a few years under your your belt leading a self-organized company, being part of a self-organized company. How do you think it is evolving and how will it evolve? I find it extremely difficult because on the on the one hand, the question is, okay, if we would compare it again, let's say with this whole development of democracies around the world, people would say, okay, if you if you just watch those wealthy nations like Switzerland or the Scandinavian countries, also, let's say, from a perspective of the U.S., eh, if you have a U.S. podcast, then you would say, okay, the Swiss is much more wealthy. They work less hours, less crime, a better health system. doesn't matter what criteria you would take. They do everything much better than the Americans. Scandinavians also. Does this mean that the Americans would have a discussion, let's try to implement the Swiss model in the US? Or, uh, so it's, I find it very difficult. So some something can be a much better model, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that there is this understanding or common sense, if this works much better, we should implement it. And, and I want to make a kind of a cultural, start a cultural difficult discussion on that, but you have it also in this very small, small topic. So if the if the Scandinavians have a much better school system, mm-hmm. as an example, or 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 have much more equal rights for women, mm-hmm. why why don't we just copy the school system from Finland or the women rights or wages from Iceland, etc. I mean mm-hmm. In the business context, we would call this balance core card or benchmarking mm-hmm. or external mm-hmm. benchmarking. But I'm pretty skeptical because it's it's not that the best solution is automatically adapted. I'm, I think I meant more within your own organization. Do you feel like there's there's space for the model to evolve? Are you challenging yeah, it, the model? It evolves. It evolves all the time. I think people like it because it creates an enormous rest and stability. Mm-hmm. But it's also, that is always difficult to say. I did a talk on holacracy in times of crisis. Mm-hmm. In times of crisis, you have a, you have a tendency to, to have a call for a strong leader. Mm-hmm. You also have this in politics. Mm-hmm. Although the opposite would be a much better option. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw uh, that YouTube video. I think it's so, leadership in times of war and peace, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so let's say if you have times of crisis, people people would vote for somebody who is extreme. It doesn't matter if it's Trump or Boris Johnson in England or does this help? No. In the end, it always harms a country. Does this mean that 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 the majority still wouldn't vote for Trump? No, because there are a lot of reasons why for those people it's the right thing to do Mm. and let's say if people in a company would believe let's say in our case that somebody who is at that moment very strong would be a better solution or if somebody would say i think we should reintroduce bonuses because somebody is much more willing to to do the extra mile or to work uh, during the weekend which we don't do at the moment Perhaps then somebody skips the model. It's this the same idea. Let's say you have a decent democracy, mm-hmm. and then and then we all think we will always stay a democracy. No, you have to you to explain, to educate, and to fight for these kind of established rights all the time. It's not something given which will stay on mm-hmm. forever. You have to to have mm-hmm. to to care about. This and to educate people and to and to show them that is some something worth to to fight for is perhaps not the real word but mm-hmm. it's it's also a kind of obligation to to invest a lot of time that everybody understands those things and if you don't do this you may have a very decent democracy or you may, may have a very decent company but but then it still goes in the wrong direction. Mm-hmm. And and if at a certain point when it goes in the wrong direction, it's very difficult to turn the ship around. Mm. I think that a lot of people, if you take, for instance, Brexit as an example, 
I mean, now the majority would have not voted in favor of Brexit, which is a kind of, I mean, and it's not long ago. So I think these are extremely complicated mm. topics. And mm. I think the only mistake you can make is that you can, that you think that you don't have to put a lot of effort in it to keep hmm. to keep the model alive mm-hmm. no matter if it's a company but it's also about the relationship if you don't mm-hmm. if you're not willing to invest in a relationship it's not something which just Mm-mm. works automatically mm-hmm. or friendships or whatsoever that's very interesting 100% agree that's so interesting reaching the end of our conversation i do have a rapid final three questions for you what book are you reading right now i'm reading this is an exception i'm reading a novel a german novel schoenwald it's a little bit like the corrections and i am reading a book about of the ffd martin wolf about uh, reinventing capitalism it's the ft uh, correspondent have to read that what have your kids taught you What have my kids taught me? That multitasking doesn't work because if you if if, if they want to play with you, they w- really want to play with you, and they want 100% of your of you, and not just half of it. And 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 nowadays you see people in restaurants eating together, even couples, and they both watch a, a cell phone, and that always reminds me they are. 100% focused in a way and then they, when they play they play mm-hmm. and, they I like also, that. and they also expect from their parents then to be 100% theirs for this play mm-hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> what's something that you are learning at the moment in business how nice it is to have a rotation system because it is we went through a difficult phase we also had to do a kind of turnaround because the market really went down i wouldn't say it's 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 not that i'm relaxing but it's perhaps yeah perhaps i'm relaxing i take this example of of the tour de france eh, of a biking group it's really nice that after you have been biking in front of the group that you can just go back in the second or third or fourth position and somebody else is 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 driving in front mm-hmm. just in the shadow of somebody mm-hmm. which is which is for a certain period also very nice because you can just re recharge your battery so to say thank you so much for opening up and and sharing everything and explaining everything that you learned and talking about Vizi and how you guys do things not every model fits in every <clears throat> in every situation in every in in every com- in, in every company but i do love bringing in different ways of doing things on the podcast so that people get nuggets of inspiration and i think that's how creativity works is when we pull from different areas and we get curious about things and that we learn and so thank you so much for being on the podcast and it was a pleasure talking to you Yeah, thanks for having me, Helena. Mm-hmm.